I'd like to talk to you about science and belief. But first of all, I should introduce myself. I am a physicist, and I have taught physics and mathematics at the University of Oxford for over 40 years. My research is in theoretical nuclear physics. I'm also a Catholic, and naturally, over the years, I have thought about the relationship between my Catholic faith and my work as a scientist. And I, now I would like to share with you some of my thoughts on science and belief. The subject of science and belief is so vast that it is difficult to know where to begin. So we follow the traditional Oxford advice, start at the beginning, go on until you reach the end, and then stop. But where is the beginning? I think there are three possibilities. First of all, the absolute beginning, before the creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was made nothing that was made. His light was the light of men, and the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The second possibility is to start at the beginning of the universe after its creation, and that is the Big Bang, the formation of radiation, matter, and the elements, and eventually the whole panorama of human history. And the third possibility is to start with the beginning of knowledge for each one of us. How do we come to know and to believe? Now, if we followed the chronological order, we would be talking about science and belief before we considered how we can know anything at all. We will therefore start with the fundamental question of how each individual learns and how eventually we have come to learn about God and about the development of the universe and the human race uh, throughout the ages. Before we actually begin, it is useful to think about what we mean by science and belief and what sort of questions we will try to answer. At it, the crudest level, it represents a dichotomy between reliable, well-grounded and verifiable knowledge on the one hand and uncertain, unverifiable fancies on the other. More briefly, it is fact versus fifth, and fifth means funny internal feeling. The sciences, we are told, are extremely careful, and scientists check all their measurements and theories, and so what they say is reliable knowledge. As for belief, and usually what is meant is religious belief, this is just a matter of feeling. One person feels one thing, and another person feels another thing, and there is nothing much to choose between them. So our main task is to take, to take this apart and to see what extent it is justified. So how have people come to believe their ideas about science and belief? Partly because it is undeniably true that, broadly speaking, scientists, at least in the well-developed branches, and here I'm of course thinking of physics, do on the whole agree with each other. I travel to the five continents in the course of my work and talk to my fellow nuclear physicists. I travel to Australia, Africa, Asia and the Americas, to Japan, India, Egypt, China, Romania, Bulgaria, Spain, Italy, Finland, Hulk, Hungary and many others. And everywhere I meet colleagues who are studying the same problems in the same way. We speak the same language. We use the same methods, and by and large, we reach the same conclusions. But if I were to speak to my colleagues about religion, the picture would be entirely different. With some I would agree, with others I would, I suspect, find such a gulf of incomprehension that we wouldn't even be able to discuss whether we agree or not. From this, we could conclude that scientific knowledge is possibly true, but that religious knowledge cannot possibly be true. Since they disagree, the various religions cannot all be correct. At the very best, one religion is right and all the others are wrong. However, a religion is usually a complex of beliefs, so that it is too crude to say that it is either right or wrong. It is more realistic to say that in every relig religion there are some truths, but mixed with much that is not true. 
Whether these concern essentials or inessentials, of course, is a matter of much discussion. We are thus led to ask how we know that a scientific statement or a statement of belief is true. What tests do we apply? What results do we obtain when we apply those tests? How can we know anything at all? And this leads to the subject of knowing, of knowing, and how do we begin to know? Even to talk about the beginning of knowledge presupposes some knowledge. I have to use words loaded with meaning after centuries of re reflection, and this cannot be avoided. All that we know is either innate, that is within ourselves, or it comes to us through our senses. It is extremely difficult to know whether we have any innate knowledge, since we can only communicate with each other through our senses. In any case, most of our knowledge comes through our senses, and so this must be our primary concern. We can therefore imagine ourselves receiving a stream of sense impressions, and from our earliest years we try to make sense of them, to build up our world picture. Our world picture. But then what is the connection between our construction and reality? So already we've got ourselves into a tangle that lies at the very heart of epistemology or the science of knowing. And this is a crucial watershed. Make the wrong move here and the whole of our philosophy is fatally flawed. The crucial question is whether we take as fundamental our mind or external reality directly perceived by the mind. If we make the former choice, we can never escape from the mind itself, and that was the fatal mistake of Descartes, Kant, and many other philosophers that led inexorably to the sterile wastes of positivism. The other road is to recognize that we have the cap capacity to grasp the external world directly. We know, definitely, and without possibility of error, what is directly in front of us. If we are willing to accept this, then we have a sound basis for knowledge. We may, may well reflect that all this seems quite obvious, and only philosophers worry about justifying such things. Indeed, we must make this step before we can even talk about the mind and sense impressions, and so acquire the concepts that we use to argue for the alternative approach. So with this essential foundation firmly in place, we can then go on to explore in more detail just how it is we come to know things. <laughs>